much for the lovely introduction and thank you all for coming. And so I want to thank uh, Professor Garth for the invitation and Mark Reese for all the logistics and help with getting me here and also to um, the students, Mr. Re Mr. Riley and Mr. Sandoval who gave me a wonderful tour all around campus and with all kinds of great stories and I'm really grateful so thank you so much for that. Um, it's a real honor to be here to speak and share some of this research I've been doing which I've had such a good time um, gathering over many years and um, I'm really sorry to hear about the pizza because that might have been a really good draw to come here and I don't know if I'll be able to make up for the fact that the pizza isn't here even though I am, but I'll try my best. Um, so, uh, I'm going to start with an example from a, a huge, um, you know what, I'm going to move this over, um, a huge public installation in the Plaza San Martin in Buenos Aires in 2011 by an installation artist named Marta Minujín. Um, called the Tower of Babel of Books. And you can see this was the sort of markup for it. It was a, um, loosely based on a Bruegel painting of the Tower of Babel. Uh, and this structure, um, you could see how it looked as they were putting it up in the plaza. It's seven stories tall, and it was a series of winding ramps that visitors would go into, all covered with books on the inside and the outside of this wire mesh. And this was one of the inaugural activities for um, World Book Capital when Buenos Aires was named World Book Capital in 2011 and 2012. It's an honor that UNESCO awards every year to a city. It started in 2001. Madrid was the first city. And there have been two Latin American cities that have been awarded this this prize or this recognition called the World Book Capital and Buenos Aires had this uh, award in 2011 and one of the activities that they did um, early on in this campaign was this big installation. So here are all the donated books arriving in boxes. Um, a, a gentleman installing them on the wire mesh, uh, each book sealed, hermetically sealed in its own plastic so that it's protected from the elements, but in such a way that they're hung so that you can actually see the cover of every book. And they were in multiple languages. And they collected 30,000 books and, uh, that were donated by individual people, embassies, consulates, uh, libraries abroad. Um, and all the books eventually were donated to one of the public libraries in Buenos Aires for the first multilingual public library there. Um, this is the ramp that you would enter to, to go up. And here's how it looked when it was finished. 26,000 people visited this structure and stood in line, long lines, waiting to go in. There, were, there was a sign with the word book in different languages. There was a, an audio recording while people were waiting and also as they were walking through the structure uh, that repeated the word book in multiple languages. And uh, here's a view from the top, uh, close to the top, looking out on the city. Uh, and eventually it was all taken down and the books uh, donated. While people were waiting in line, um, they were all given a little book with uh, Jorge Luis Borges' story, The Library of Babel. And the, it's, there's a little bit of information about the structure on the back. So this was reprinted in this little book that everybody could take home. So I'm going to pass. Oh, I have a lot of show and tell. So there's stuff to pass around that you can see. Um, and, uh, and even if you don't read Spanish, I'm not sure how many of you are, are students of Spanish or already know Spanish, but it's, it's fun to see these objects and see what they've done and how they've been circulated in public space, even if you, you don't have, there's not a quiz at the end about what's inside these books. So we're, we're doing the, we are judging the book by the cover today. <laughs> so uh, so this, this was such a popular event, this particular structure, that they kept it up 
a month longer than they intended to because the demand was so high for people to come running and stand in line and walk through this, this sort of experiential structure of this Tower of Babel of books. And I, I, li I wanted to start with that example um, to introduce the kind of programs I've been studying. Some of them are very, very um, um, broad scale, uh, huge municipal projects like this installation was, which was expensive. They had to have engineers and architects and builders and the campaign to, to donate the books and all of that. And some of them are very grassroots, um, very grassroots. A couple of people get together and decide to do something in their house or in their basement and everything in between. Um, to look at how in recent years, I would say since 2000 roughly, all over Latin America, different cities have been doing events and activities and book circulating campaigns to get people reading literature. Not so much to teach them how to read, these are not literacy programs, but to get people reading and talking about books and talking to each other about books, using the literature as a kind of a bridge between people, between people from different neighborhoods, from different social classes, of different ages and generations, <coughs> to talk to each other and develop more trust with each other, particularly after periods of dictatorship, repression, and censorship in some countries. Or in the case of Colombia, for example, after years of decades and decades of political violence and uh, terrorism and uh, assassinations and um, kidnappings, uh, how to reconstruct a civil society where people are going to talk to each other and feel comfortable with each other and begin to trust each other. Not that literature is going to do this all by itself, but literature circulating around in spaces that are not so much just schools, universities, and libraries, but in other kinds of places, like in a public square, in the example I just gave of the installation, or as you'll see in a few minutes, on public transportation, uh, or um, outside of the trunks of people's cars parked in their garages. There are some projects like that in, uh, in Mexico and in a few other places. So there, there are all kinds of ways that literature is harnessed harnessed for its social value, for its ability to get people having a common conversation, when for many years, for all kinds of different political and social and economic reasons, they couldn't, or there was very little of that, or there was a lot of distrust and a lot of hesitation to broach a normal conversation with somebody that you didn't know. Um, so there are a couple of, um, this is an example of, uh, a definition of public space from a, a social sciences think tank that I thought was interesting, particularly the whole idea of the circulation, the movement, that, that it's not so much about collecting books and having them stuck somewhere on shelves in a big building, but having them move around, having them circulate, having them available in places you wouldn't expect, and using um, plazas, transportation, book fairs, murals, um, all kinds of different things to uh, promote them, make people aware of them, and invite people to use them. Um, this is a, these are the kind of programs where you don't have to buy anything, where the literature is, is, is free, it's available, it's shared. It's available in, in motor vehicle offices, in places where you would register your pet and get a rabies license from the vaccine, where you would pay a traffic fine. Um, these kind of places that now are more and more having literature to read. So here's just another, another uh, explanation about how reclaiming and reinvigorating the public and public space um, is, is one of the strategies to help rebuild um, a civil society. So I was very interested in my research, I came across that in Colombia there's actually a department, a sort of an official government bureau for the defense of public space. And I found that really fascinating. I don't think we have something like that. I mean, we have the Department of the Interior, but that's a little bit more having to do with, you know, national parks and other kinds of things. I don't think we really have any sort of government bureau that I know of in the United States that, that protects, you know, 
a, a park in New York City or something like that. So I thought this, you know, just a little quote from a brochure about this was very interesting of looking at, at public space as, you know, buildings or natural elements that are really for collective needs. So this is, all of these reading programs are all about reading in community, reading collectively. Not that it's not a great thing to read alone, but it's sort of breaking down that idea of you go in your own room or you sit under a tree quietly or you're having your own private experience with a book, which is also fabulous. Nobody's saying that that's not a good thing. But what about talking about those experiences and having that experience where it's open and it could, it could prompt new kinds of connections and interactions among people than the ones that they've been having. Um, and all of this is to promote uh, another way of saying all this, I could say, is convivencia, which is a term that is not so easy to translate in, into English. I don't think we really have exactly, I can, we can ask our, our, our resident chief linguist what he thinks, but, um, you know, li literally it means living together with others. Vivir is to live and con is the preposition for with. But um, I mean, we have the word in English conviviality, but that's more of like a personality trait or, you know, if somebody's convivial, it, does, it doesn't have the same sense of convivencia. And in all of the project proposals, funding proposals, announcements in, in newspapers and on posters and in flyers uh, and on websites about all of these kind of programs, this term convivencia comes up over and over and over again. So I've just... Um, outlined a few things there related to that. I'm not going to repeat that so we can just keep moving. So I've been looking at what I call public reading programs. Now a public reading could be someone standing, you know, and reading poetry or reading from their work or someone else's work um, out loud, but I'm, I'm defining them a little bit in a different way. Programs that aim to do these things I've been mentioning, create this com common conversation, um, provide collective literary experiences, not just for students of literature or for intellectuals or people who can afford to buy books, but for anyone. Anyone can understand a story. Anyone can enjoy reading a fable or a one-act play or mystic poetry or a classic. Um, and doing that with this reliance on the infrastructure of public urban spaces. So, okay, you can read that yourselves. Um, a, a campaign poster for the um, International Day of the Book in Chile, Leer es viajar, reading is traveling. So this was like, you know, if you read, it allows you to go to other places. That You see a lot of this kind of uh, promoting reading from, you know, uh, different national uh, offices and, and, and agencies that promote reading. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the programs on public transportation. Um, one of the first ones was um, called uh, Libro al Viento in Bogota, Colombia. And it worked initially together with the Transmilenio buses. You're probably wondering why you're seeing this bus here. The, these were bus rapid, it was a bus rapid transit system that was put in in Bogota. There's a very similar one in in. Santiago called the Trans Santiago. There's also now Metrobus, which is a very similar system in Buenos Aires and also in Mexico City. And they're, they're faster, they're cleaner, they don't pollute as much, um, and they hold lots and lots of people. So this was the, these innovations all came at the early part of the, 20, of the 21st century in a lot of these cities. Oh, it looks like there's food. That's good. Okay, everybody will be happier. I like that. So this is what the Transantiago buses look like. They were modeled very much right after the, the ones in Bogota. And here are the long lines of people waiting to get on them. Here is um, the subway in Santiago, Chile. They're very proud of it. It's very modern, very clean, very efficient. Um, in Mexico City, you see the metro, which is the name for the subway there, is culture. So I think that we wouldn't necessarily think of the metro in Washington, D.C., or the subway in New York City, uh, or BART in San Francisco, as being associated with culture. But there's a lot of kind of public noise 
you know, posters, advertising, promotional things, you know, talking about how these systems are spaces for promoting culture. So one of the, one of the, uh, one of these um, programs, uh, the first, one of the first ones was Para Leer de Boleto en el Metro in Mexico City, and they published, they started publishing on the line that goes to the university campus in, in to the UNAM, um, uh, anthologies that people could read while they were on the train and on the subway and then return them. Of course, people didn't want to return them because they're really adorable and they're, they're, they're really fun, younger writers, and, and they, people wanted to collect them. So they were kind of a victim of their own success. They had to start having arrangements where you had to return them at the other end of the line with people there making sure that you did. But it was sort of interesting that people really got excited about them. And so I'll pass these around so you can see in the, the rooftops of all the houses on the cover are an open book. So the, the, the graphic design is very inviting. This is not a, an intimidating text. You know, it's not like some tome bound in leather that makes you feel like, ooh, I have to know something about this to read it. They're very small and they're lightweight and they can fit in your pocket or your bag and they're colorful. And so the, the whole message was this is for everybody. Everybody can read this and enjoy this. Um, and it's come and gone that program, but it's still going on in one way or another. This was one of the posters for it. Um, the graphic is exactly like what the subway tickets looked like. And so um, here are the shelves in the subway station where the anthologies would be waiting. And a very similar program that started the same year, both of them started in 2004, is called, which I mentioned a minute ago, Libro al Viento in Bogota, Colombia. And this one, they had initially little lockers at, the, at some of the main um, stations of the Transmilenio buses with staff there so that they'd be protected from the weather and stuff. But they're also in markets, hospitals, soup kitchens, um, municipal offices of different kinds, um, fruit and vegetable markets. And this is what the books look like. They're all this shape. They're different colors. Um, the, I just brought two so that you could see. I'll, I'll pass one this way and one this way so that the people over on this side you know, get a chance to see everything. Um, so, so these, uh, these books were also a very big success. Uh, this program is still going on. Initially, it was one book a month, and they published around 50 or 60,000 copies. And they can publish the books pretty cheaply there. And uh, they get various co-sponsors, so it's often a, a, a sort of public-private thing. And um, this was a newspaper article. You can see. Um, some of the book covers. Again, you'll notice they're small, they're easy to handle, they're not intimidating, um, they're bright colors. Uh, if it's one author or a group of authors or something, it's written along the side. Um, and many of them had to do with <coughs> Colombian literature, but also world literature. The, first, the very first book in Libra al Viento was Sophocles' play Antigone. And the second one was a selection of stories by Garcia Marquez. So it went from the world literature to, to local or national writers. And um, they have library, sort of a library stand in parks where you can get these books. And um, I'm going to just move a little bit faster so that I make sure we have time for questions. But I wanted to give you at least an overview of the kinds of examples of these programs that there are. Another one in Santiago, Chile, is Santiago en Cien Palabras, which means Santiago in 100 words. These are very many short stories written by anyone in less than 100 words. So they're almost like a prose poem. There are these very adorable anecdotes. And the winning stories are published in huge billboards in the subway and on at bus stops, and you can see the number of people. This is the number of stories submitted each year, and it's continued to be in the 40 and 50,000. Um, but you get the idea. It started out, you know, 2,600 or so people submitted a story, and now it's over 50,000 people. So it's become a huge success since 2001. It's continuing. Here are some of the logos, and they've handed out bookmarks and calendars and and 
magnets and all kinds of things with the stories on them, little, little cards printed with the stories on them. And there's a cash prize as well as the notoriety of having your name in light, so to speak, in these huge uh, spaces of public confluence. Um, it started out with paper stories submitted um, in mailboxes that were in the subway stations. And it's co-sponsored by a mining company, the transportation company, and um, a private literary magazine called Plagio. And once a year, they publish a little collection, very little, here they are, <laughs> of the 100 favorite stories um, based on the jury that they select. And they give these out free, 100,000 copies in the subway. And they have mimes and actors and musicians running in and out of the cars, giving out these books once a year. And it's like a big thing. Everybody waits every year to see what these, these little books are going to be like. So now you can get a look at those. Um, and I'll show you some examples of, of one or two of the stories. They're really very fun. Here is what a story looked like on the billboard. These are advertising billboards. They don't keep the stories up there beyond a couple of weeks. Uh, then it's going to be you know, a shampoo ad or a car ad or a whatever for advertising. Um, but you know, they're really, the, the graphics are bright and, and, and cheery. And you can see people really stop and read them. Um, there are even children, very young children, that submit stories. And they have a separate prize for youth and a separate prize now for teenagers. There's, uh, now it's all online. And they have also a sort of a public favorite. So they'll put 10 or 20 stories that have been submitted online. And you can vote online. It's like American Idol. You can kind of vote for your favorite story. So it's, they try to get all this public participation, not just from the writers, but also from anybody who sees them or the readers out there. Um, it, here's one of my favorites. The, the title of the story is Note Found on the Back of a Bus Seat. And the idea is that it was written with marker on the vinyl of the bus seat. I couldn't think of any other way to find you to let you know. Mom, Dad, I'm fine, and I forgive you. And it's a really charming story when you think about Edgar Allan Poe wrote a story about uh, a note in a bottle, manuscript found in a bottle. Um, uh, uh, Cortázar wrote a story called um, Manuscript Found in a Pocket. So it kind of takes up that whole idea of a found thing. And obviously, it brings in whoever the reader is who would see that on the bus seat. I don't think they actually went in and, and, and vandalized a bus to, to write it on the back of a bus seat. But it's in such a small number of words, the amount of feeling and tension and emotion that you can see was going on in that family, obviously, you know, it leaves open a lot of questions. But that's, that's one that I really like. And that was written by somebody uh, 21 years old. Um, another thing we've seen a lot are um, branches of public libraries in subway and bus stations. Um, so I just have a few quick pictures here. This is in Mexi Mexico City. It's called Libro Puerto, or Bridge to Books. Um, in Bogota, they now have a, a sort of a mobile unit. It sort of looks like a, like a kiosk or something. And it has wheels, so it actually can move around. And it's a branch of the public library. You can apply for a library card. You can pick up books, return books. And they have the Libro al Viento books there now. Um, Biblio Metro in Santiago. I think Madrid and Santiago were the first cities to ever have this kind of idea of library branches inside subway stations. Um, uh, there's one, uh, uh, one in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And that's one side of it. It was shaped in such a way it was hard to get a picture of the whole thing. But you can see someone here when I was there. There are books in the window. And you could see somebody getting help, taking something out. I mean, there was interaction. I visited a lot of these. I, I, there are some in Mexico City also. There are about five metro stops in Mexico City that have a branch of the library. And they had those even had like a couch in them and a table. You could go in there and sit down. You know, so very, and, and, and always a librarian there to um, tend to people who came and had questions. Um, 
I want to focus briefly on my last examples, which have to do with reading under crisis. Some of these have been kind of celebratory programs to say, you know, hooray, books, literature, it's all great. Um, and I think it's important to note that these come out of, mom in many cases, moments of crisis or tension that um, where the country is trying to pull together in a lot of different ways and from all kinds of different angles to restore some kind of sense of well-being and citizenship and, and participatory civic behavior. And in um, Argentina in 2001 and 2002, late in 2001, there was a huge uh, economic and political crisis and, a, and actually a collapse of the government. There were five presidents within two weeks. Um, the, the banks closed. People couldn't get their money out. Many, many businesses shut down. Uh, a huge number of people um, who had had jobs and businesses were lost everything and were uh, reduced to collecting garbage in the streets. They were called cartoneros because they picked up cardboard and sold it to uh, recycling centers through the city's municipal refuse system. And under this period, th the neighborhoods really got together and created these solidarity organizations called asambleas or assemblies and decided they had to take matters into their own hands and help provide things for one another. And I was fascinated that even when people had, didn't have money for school, were losing their homes, um, they were hungry, they couldn't afford medical care and medicines, they all felt that reading was an essential tool. I actually found this shocking, I have to say. I think if I were in that situation, I don't know whether uh, the first thing I would turn to would be a book. But in all of these organizations, they published newsletters. This is a poem by, um, by an Uruguayan poet and writer, Eduardo Galeano, about utopia, painted, uh, printed around the pot with the spoon because there were a lot of protests where people went outside with pots and pans and banged on the pots and pans as a noisy but peaceful way of protesting. So that was quite famous. Um, here's what the here's the poem that happened to be, you know, printed on that particular newsletter. Um, the covers of the newsletters often had, you could see what was important to them. This was the logo for this particular um, neighborhood association. The newsletters. This was really when the internet was was pretty young there, and not a lot of people didn't have computers, and the websites were just beginning. So this was a way to tell people when were the meetings, when was there going to be um, a bartering fair where you could bring the eggs from your chicken and maybe someone would sew your kids' school uniforms, or you could exchange school books, or you could exchange, um, you know, they set up food pantries, all kinds of help for the neighborhood, and they did this all themselves. And this one, you can see what are the important things, housing, health care, the cross, um, jobs in factories, uh, books, and bread. So I thought it was fascinating. This is one of my favorite examples of how of the five things that they decided to highlight in this logo, one of them is books. And they set up neighborhood libraries in abandoned buildings. This was a questionnaire to ask people how they thought they might want to use a building that was not being used that they could occupy. And uh, people responded to the questionnaire, and the group published the results. Um, you can see the results here. And of the four things that they thought were most important, one of them was a neighborhood library. So I, I, I found these um, newsletters in the Princeton University Library. They're all there. It's absolutely fascinating because these are really kind of grassroots, ordinary people just coming together and writing these things, getting the guy who had a photocopy machine on the corner to print them. People would pay 50 cents or something to offset the cost of the paper. And it was really fascinating to see how in the newsletters they printed a lot of poetry and quotes from books, and a lot of the efforts went to collecting books for neighborhood libraries. Um, so that's another example that I study. Out of this same crisis came um, a very fascinating publishing phenomenon where people started using that reused cardboard from the street that I just mentioned that people were collecting in the crisis to bind books because there was almost no book publishing for a couple of years while the country went through this crisis. So 
um, a writer named Washington Cucurto. It's a, it's a pen name, it's not his real name. Um, they started the first one of these kinds of small, very, very small independent presses. Um, it's a cooperative called Eloisa Cartonera. And this is the cover, the front of their window at their studio. They actually now have a new studio. But you can see that on there it says mucho más que libros, much more than books. Again, this idea that it's books, but books for another purpose, books to help connect people and reconstruct, rebuild, and re-establish uh, uh, effective ties, community ties, aesthetic ties. So you can see a few quotes from some of these uh, members of this group. This is a quote from Cucurto. I've, I've been there several times and I've interviewed them. And you know, their idea is that the books are not an end in themselves. The books are a means to a more human way of working together and getting along. Um, uh, another quote from another member of the group, um, Maria Gomez, the book must be more than this. It's a social necessity. It has a humble but powerful path. Um, here is Washington Cucurto in the studio. You can see the books are really bright colors. Um, of course, I brought some for you to see from a few different groups, um, from a Mexican group, uh, a, a Brazilian group, a Chilean group. They're now um, groups of these, uh, these publishers, these small uh, neighborhood publishers all over Latin America, and even some, there's one in Finland by a Peruvian, there are some in France, there is a bunch in Spain. The first one in Spain was called Las Meninas, Cartonera, um, for the famous painting by Velázquez. And now there are dozens of them in Europe also, you know, often connected with a Latin American who's living there. Um, so I'm just going to show a few quick pictures of uh, painting books with them. Um, here's another picture of the books. You'll see them, but they're very, very bright colors. They're very cheap. They cost four or five dollars a copy, and it'll be a short story, a chapter of something, a selection of poems, and the writers do not get any copyright for it. So the writers participate to be part of the collective, and um, in most of the cases, they don't um, get anything back for it, but it's often a way of launching their careers when they're not being published somewhere else. Um, uh, there's an, one in Uruguay. I'm going to go kind of fast here so we can end in a minute. But um, this idea that literature should not only be for people at the top, for people who have a lot of money, for people who consider themselves intellectuals, that literature should be for everyone. And, and that anybody can participate in it and be part of it, and it should be accessible. Um, so uh, this is the one, in, the one in Brazil is called Dulcinea Catadora which is a very charming name because Dulcinea, some of you may know, was, was, was Don Quixote's love interest. And it turns out that one of the cardboard pickers in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, when they started this group, her name actually was Dulcinea. So it's kind of got a literary reference, and it also honors one of the first um, cardboard pickers in that, who was part of that group. Their, their, their sort of studio, if you want to call it that, is underneath a highway where the garbage is collected and then sorted. And uh, I visited with them and spent a day with them. And two of the books going around are theirs. And they tie them with thread. So you can see the, the string that they use, a big, long needle, and they tie them. Some of the others use a staple and glue. It's incredibly cheap, basic. This is like elementary school projects, you know? Um, Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or something. It's really tempera paint, glue, paste, staples, and cardboard. That's it, and, and photocopied pages. So I think this is by um, an interesting quote by Lucia Rosa, who's an artist who started the Brazilian group, the first Brazilian group, the one called Dulcinea. And I think this um, quote about you know, cardboard and garbage being considered dirty, you know, bad, something we want to get rid of, and revalorizing that, giving it a new kind of meaning by making something productive out of it, is something that really helps the people that have to do this for a living. So the members of the group that actually make these books are garbage pickers. That's not the case in all the different places where these are. It varies quite a lot. Um, so I just want to end with an example of 
um, a newspaper kiosk that the Eloisa Cartonera group bought. And of course, the newspaper kiosk is a very important uh, cultural element in Latin American cities historically in the 19th century in a lot of cities where there were big literacy campaigns and where print culture in newspapers and magazines and serial books that came out in small um, pamphlets. This is where you could get all of these materials and it really helped build a kind of national uh, consolidated way of thinking. Um, they bought this newspaper kiosk and they don't have newspapers there. It's filled with Cartonera books. And it's right on Avenida Corrientes, which is the busiest street in downtown Buenos Aires, and also a literary street that's full of bookstores. Up and down both sides of this huge avenue are bookstores everywhere. And so they open this in the evenings, pretty much from about 5 to 9 or 10, when people are getting out of work and going to their buses or the subway or going home. And people stop by who wouldn't even know about this um, otherwise. Uh, so. It's a nice way to really do outreach and people buy books and sometimes they have readings and um, I think it's a nice uh, extension outside of the other circuits and you can see this, uh, you know, another way of really providing outreach and putting these books in a place that normally you wouldn't find necessarily this kind of literature. Um, here's the mural that was on the back of their original kiosk that they got, it kind of fell apart and they now have a new one. So um, I wanted to finish. I know I went a little bit fast, but I want to make sure there's some time for questions. So forgive me if I've gone a little bit too fast. Um, I wanted to end with one of the short stories from Santiago in 100 Words. Um, I look at you in the mirror that the glass creates as we pass through the tunnel. You're distracted reading a book. From time to time, you look up and catch my gaze traced on the window pane. I'm frightened. I hide and cover my face with my book. You get tired and go back to yours. So the metro is a battlefield. The book is a trench. And your gaze is a shot that sometimes announces the next station. So I really like this one just to end with a little story that came from one of these projects. The, the title is Reflection, Reflejo, that way that we catch somebody's gaze in the reflection in the window on a bus or a subway or a train car and you, you don't know whether to make eye contact or not make eye contact. And um, this idea of reading being a refuge and the world out there can be a battlefield sometimes and you all know that much better than I do. Um, and I uh, am very proud of the work that you're doing and your dedication and I want to thank you for that. And it's such an honor to have been here to speak today. And I thought that this story was a way of, uh, with that metaphor, really looking at how literature can be this refuge, but how it can also be a point of connection where we can learn about another way of thinking about things and talk to people about it and share it and not have it only be something for ourselves, but something we can share with others. So thank you so much. I want to leave time for questions. gotten some food, so I can keep you here <laughs> to actually, so we can actually have a little bit of discussion. Food, we like food. Food and reading, what could be better well, than I've that? Gotta, I've <laughs> got to tell this story. I wasn't planning to talk about myself at all, but I've got to tell this story. Marcy didn't know this, even though we've known each other for 30, oh. over 30 years. I met my spouse of 30 years at a bus stop, and we started con conversing because we were reading at the bus stop, and we started talking about what we were reading. So, here you go. So I'm happy to answer questions. I, I know I went awfully quickly and I wanted to give you more examples and a little less information so that you would get a sense of the broad scope of these kind of initiatives. But um, each one kind of has its own backstory and in each country or city, of course, they're a little bit different. These are all totally independent initiatives. They're not part of any international campaign or anything. They're just. I've started noticing them, and it, it ended up being so many of them that it turned into a book. So I'm happy to answer questions. questions. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that it was the main push was to make sure that literature wasn't only focused on the higher classes, and as a cause of that, it caused more camaraderie. And the uh, question is, do you think this is served as kind of a catalyst that brought people together to, as you have, have, have seen in the past decade, that
I, I hope so. That it's a great question. It's a great question, and I think that actually I see it sort of from both sides. Sometimes I think that municipal governments like a mayor's office or city hall would, you know, try to promote things that would create a more peaceful, a more cooperative, a more sort of mutual understanding among people through literature and art and um, more interesting activities in public space or cleaning up parks, making the facilities in public space um, more, more amenable, more accessible for people, safer. Um, and I think then you have this other movement from the other side that reading this literature or, or seeing that the city is providing some things for inhabitants, for, for residents that are, that are interesting, that are stimulating, that are creative, um, breaks down some barriers and allows people to feel more, more engaged civically, I think. It's subtle and it's so hard to measure these things. And people sometimes ask me about that. How do you, how do you know if these programs are effective? And I think that sometimes you know because they've lasted such a long time. They don't seem to be sort of flash in the pan kind of initiatives. They seem to keep being able to get funding even in hard times. And, and, and I'll give you an example from Columbia. Um, one, of, one of the beautiful books, I didn't bring this one, but it's a, I think it's available online. And it's called Cartas de la Persistencia. And they did a call, and this was national. The sort of National Archives in Colombia did this call for letters. They figured anybody can write a letter. Maybe not everybody can write a short story or a poem or a novel, but everyone has written a letter or an email or some communication. And they asked people to write letters about perseverance, about going through a hard time and having persevered in some way and what helped them keep going. And they got thousands, they got like 5,000 letters from people all over the country, from people of all social classes and all ages. And people wrote about hard economic times, about losing a family member. Many people wrote about the armed conflict and about losing neighbors and family members to the armed conflict. People wrote about kidnappings. Um, people wrote about you know, a relationship that fell apart or di being disappointed in a parent or in a child, all kinds of, from the personal to the political. And it was really amazing. And they saved them all, and they have an archive of all the letters. And the book that was published by Libro al Viento is a small selection. I mean, but it's probably got 40 of the letters or something in there. And it's so inspiring to see that just ordinary people wanted to write about their own ways of getting through things. So I think it's an example, I hope that it doesn't sound like it's off the topic, that answers your question of sort of creating lines of communication in different ways and then disseminating the results. So these are, the originals are at the National Archive and the, there is a website and, the, and then the book is available online and then the book was one of the books on the subway, on the buses and, the, and in municipal offices. So it's like, I think they did an exhibit at a museum of some of the letters, so it's a way that there's a recognition for hard times and a recognition for that perseverance and that persistence to keep going and have faith or hope that you'll get through it. So I, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Yes. I haven't either. Not on those parts of the world necessarily, but. <laughs> what, what do you think uh, made it happen here? What, what's unique about their culture and what, the experience they had? Thank you for that question. Yeah, I think that's a really another great question. The book and reading have been very, very important in Latin American development. I mean, you, you definitely see it in cities, but it's not only in cities. That was really my focus, but uh, in, in the book that I wrote, I, di I do talk about some rural programs that have also been uh, very inspiring. There's a cartonera group that makes these cardboard books in rural Peru that makes textbooks that are bilingual in Quechua and Spanish. And 
and, and captures a lot of folk tales and songs, um, names in, in the Quechua language for plants and birds that are part of that environment, and they use them in schools, and the kids help decorate them. So, you know, there are extensions of a lot of these things and, and other ones that, that pertain to, to rural life, too. And I think that it, books were so important for establishing new nations in Latin America after independence from Spain and, in the case of Brazil, Portugal. And the, it's, it was very early on that national libraries, archives, these type of institutions were established. And you can see that that was considered a priority for the people who were really working towards setting up these, these new, new countries that were going to be independent. And I think that that has, um, I think that the Bible and, and missionary work which um, did a lot of horrible things and a lot of human rights abuses, as we know, during the colonial period, but it also established a kind of a culture of the book in a lot of ways, where people respected that book and knew that that book was important. And so I think that there are, there are a number of strains, also that really for early nation building, as I mentioned, newspapers and magazines, print culture was very, very important for establishing certain kinds of values, not that everyone necessarily agreed, but even having debates, fierce debates, within these, um, these print media. And um, I think Benedict Anderson's book, um, um, Imagined Communities, is a, good, is a good reference, if you're interested in that, that doesn't only talk about Latin America, but talks about how um, to, to create a, the idea of, of a collective group that's around a sort of a national identity when that national identity hasn't existed yet and it's new requires a lot of times uh, all kinds of different print materials. Even for people who couldn't read, they would see them, people would read them aloud, um, kids in school would bring things home and read them to their parents or have them with their parents. Even the um, printed things like printed money and the images and the messages that are printed on, on, on printed money and on coins, all of, that, all of those sort of images helped create a kind of a, a common and collective identity. And I think that the book and reading have been at the core of that throughout Latin American history, uh, sometimes to the exclusion of classes who didn't have enough education or to regions where some of those um, advances didn't, didn't reach, and that's a whole other problem of, of, of inequality. But it still has been a kind of core element of that. I think we have to let you guys go. Um, thank you again. Thank you so much. <laughs>